You have to renounce Joseph Smith. You have to renounce Mormonism. And you have to acknowledge and confess that the real Jesus is not Lucifer's brother. The real Jesus is the eternal son, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, because the true God is triune. Meaning, you've been taught God the Father was a man. He has a body of flesh. And then he sired Yahweh, who then took on a body of flesh. And the Holy Spirit is a spirit personage. But he may be able to take flesh. That's open. They don't know. That's blasphemy. That's three gods and they're false gods. The God of Scripture, the God of reality, the true God, the God worshipped and glorified by the church for the first 400 years and onwards is the triune God. Triune meaning the one God is the eternal Father in inseparable union with his eternal son and eternal spirit. Not three gods, not one God older than the other gods, not one God who is a man who became God, but the one eternal father in inseparable union with his eternal son and spirit. They've always existed as the one God and the Father, Son, and Spirit created everything in creation, brought creation to being from nothing, sustains creation. And this is the God who saves. This is the God who alone can save you. And this is the God you must worship. So you have to renounce Mormonism. You have to renounce Joseph Smith. You have to then get validly baptized and begin your catechesis, meaning your understanding of the faith. Now, before I quote any verses, do you have any questions before I give you some more verses? Because I have some verses I have to give you. One question I would have, it's, it's kind of personal, but kind of not as well. It, 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 so, when you say the baptism wasn't valid, is that because of the Godhead that yes. Mormonism yes. worships? Yes, your baptism was invalid because you're baptized into false gods. You're baptized right. into God the Father, who's a man who has a body of flesh. That's a false god. You're then baptized into the Son, who's Yahweh, whom he sired, because God the Father has a heavenly wife. The Bible already warned about people like Joseph Smith. Here, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 to 4. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. Now he's talking to Christians that he converted, and he's their spiritual father, and they are his spiritual children. So he's so not coming. This right? is Christ. Is this Christ talking? This is Paul writing to the church. Oh, okay. The New Testament, 27 books written by the eyewitnesses of Christ or the disciples of the eyewitnesses. So you're going to have to start putting the Book of Mormon aside, start reading your Bible, the New Testament, get to know the real Jesus. So you're going to start yep. with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to know the real Jesus. But I'll give you this link, Bible Gateway, because it has English translations galore. But here Paul is writing to a group of Gentiles who were pagans that converted and got baptized through his preaching. So he's writing to them because there were wolves who were infiltrating. So I want you to hear the background. And he's exhorting them and warning them. How is it that you so easily have been deceived by false Christians when you saw my ministry, you see me do miracles showing you that Jesus is with me and I'm preaching the truth and now you're starting to doubt. So he's writing to them. This is where you'll see the source of Joseph Smith. False teachers, false Christ, false prophets are in energized, empowered by Satan and demons because Satan doesn't want you to know the truth. You can be religious. You can believe in a Jesus. As long as it's not the real Jesus, he doesn't care. And here, Paul says it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Put up with me having to speak in such a manner, because you forced me to speak in such a manner, but put up with me, because I want to make a point. That's what Paul is saying. I am right. jealous for you. I am zealous for you with a godly jealousy. Why? Because I engage you to one husband. Now, again, to break down the metaphor. The Bible says when believers are baptized into Christ, you then become the bride of Christ, the church. So mm -hmm. as the bride of Christ, you're a spiritual virgin. You're spiritually pure. And you have to keep your purity until Jesus returns. So Paul is saying, you're my daughter spiritually. And I already engaged you to Christ, your spiritual husband. It's not physical. It's spiritual. Christ marries us. We become one with him in the spirit. So I'm presenting you as a pure virgin to Christ, you see. But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, Satan corrupts and pollutes your mind and gets you to believe false things. Your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Well, how does he corrupt your mind? Here, this is where you're going to find Joseph Smith and Muhammad. For one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we did not preach. That's Joseph Smith. That's Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Or you receive a different spirit 
which you did not receive. That's Joseph Smith. That's Muhammad. You received not the true Holy Spirit, a different spirit. You believe not in the real Jesus, but another Jesus that Paul did not preach. Or a different gospel, which you did not accept. You bear this beautifully. You see? If you knew your Bible, you would know the Bible warned about people like Joseph Smith. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. Look what he says about Satan's servants. He talks about these false prophets and apostles who preach falsehood. For such men are false apostles. That's Joseph Smith. Deceitful workers, Joseph Smith, who deceived you, connived you, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Isn't that what Joseph Smith claimed? That he's a prophet commissioned by God, the Father, Jesus Christ, and the angel Moroni? That's true. Paul warned you about Joseph Smith 2,000 years ago. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Didn't Joseph Smith say that the angel Moroni appeared to him? He did. But Paul told you that wasn't Moroni, that was Satan, because Satan appears as an angel to supposedly give you light to bring you to salvation. Mm. Therefore, it is not surprising if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. And how did Joseph Smith's life end? Badly and miserably. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Didn't Paul say the end, the outcome of their life will expose them? For being not of God, but of Satan? He did. He did. <laughs> he did. See, that's laughter from the joy of the Holy Spirit filling you. But do you see why Mormons <laughs> are deceived? Because they don't know the Bible. And let me tell you another strategy of Satan. Satan has to get you to lose faith in the Bible. Because he knows if you believe in the Bible, he cannot deceive you if you properly interpret Scripture. So guess what all the cults tell you? Oh, the Bible's corrupt. Oh, the Bible's not correct. We need to interpret it for you. Yep. Isn't that what Mormonism yep. teaches you? Yep, it teaches us that in the Nicene Creed, the Bible was changed um, and corrupted and that the Catholic Church can't be trusted because they changed the Bible uh, during the Nicene Creed. See, now, what did they just admit to you? The Catholic Church was there in the 4th century, didn't they? That's 300. Yeah. yeah. So even Mormonism, the enemy of the true church, just admitted to you the Catholics have been there at least from the 4th century 300s, because they're at the Council of Nicaea. And by the way, Catholic means universal. At that time, all the Christians were one. Right. But they admitted to you, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, they did. They told, uh, they tell, they tell us that during the Nicene Creed in 325, the Bible was changed by by the people the, that were there. The Catholic Church, right? Yeah, by the Catholic Church. So they just admit to you the Catholic Church is ancient. It's been there for centuries, right? Yeah. You were told by Paul, Satan demons can appear as angels of light. And the way you're going to know it's Satan is that he will then present to you another Jesus, not the Jesus believed on historically for 2000 years. And he will present a different spirit and a different gospel. That's Mormonism. The Jesus of Mormonism is Yahweh, who was sired by God, the father, who was a man who has a body of flesh. And Jesus is Lucifer's older brother. I challenge any Mormon to show me within the first 1,700 years of the history of the church, because Joseph Smith popped up in the 1800s. Anyone who taught this, anybody, anyone, even heretics, no one taught this. And Paul warned you, that's how Satan will deceive you. But mm -hmm. the catch is this. The Mormons, the Muslims know, if you believe in the Bible and you trust the Bible and you believe it's accurate, they can't deceive you. So what do they tell you? No, the Bible's been changed and corrupted. So you need the Mormon church to explain to you the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's what they all say. You can't trust the Bible. You need us to explain the Bible. But then when I say, hold on, but the Catholic church, the Orthodox church, they've been there for 2,000 years. They were started by the apostles. And they have the writings of these Christian men, theologians and apologists and fathers, who were trained by the apostles disciples of the apostles who became the bishops whom the Lord used to preserve the church. And those bishops appointed others. And we have these writings from the apostles to their successors, this unbroken chain, centuries of writings. And they all interpret the Bible differently than you did. You're telling me they're all wrong. And now you got it right. 1700 years later. One thing that always really confused me is that, because I know there's a, there's a verse in, in John, and it says that God is spirit. Yes. And that, that's that, always, 
that always confuse me uh, as to how we can be spirit and have a body of flesh at the same time. Very easy. When Jesus says God is spirit, he means the divine nature. So you have human nature, right? Yeah. I have human nature. God has a nature. The nature of God, which we would call the divine nature. He's saying God as God. God in relation to his nature is spirit, meaning God is not the kind of being that has a body, has a shape, and needs space and place. Unlike the rest of us, we humans are flesh. We have bodies. Our bodies need space and place and need sustenance. So <coughs> Jesus is contrasting the way God exists from the way creation exists. See, you are flesh. God is not flesh. God is spirit. Now, the question is, this God who's spirit, meaning he has no body, no shape, because he created all shapes, all forms. He created space, time. Now, follow me logically. If God yep. created space, time, and place, that means he exists without time, right? Because he yep. created time. Yeah. And he exists without place, right? Yeah. And he exists without place, uh, space, right? Yeah, because he created, he created them all. Yeah. Which means he's a kind of being that doesn't need space and place to exist, which means he doesn't have a shape or a body because bodies and shapes need space and place. So that's what it yeah, means. That makes spirit. sense. That that's makes what sense. it means. He's spirit. But let's take it a step further. Can that God, who as God is spirit, add to himself another nature without ceasing to be God? Does well, he have the capacity to do that? Yeah, of course, because he, he can do anything. That's what Jesus did. That's the thing. Jesus is flesh because he became human from the virgin. Mm. Jesus is a human. Jesus is a man. He wasn't always a man. He became man when he entered the womb of that holy Mary. Now, that's where Mary comes in. You see why Mary showed up to you? Yeah. Because it was yeah. Mary that Jesus created, his blessed and beautiful mother, to then take flesh from her so he can become man like us. Mm -hmm. That's why you saw the blessed mother. Because you see your question relates to her. As God he has no mother, he only has a father, and he's one with him in nature. As man, he has a mother, no father, and he's one with her in her nature. Mm. See how it worked? Yeah, that makes sense. He's always been God because he's always existed with the father, right? Yeah. And whatever his father's nature is, that would be his nature because like begets like, kind begets kind. So if God is his father, and he's always been with the father from before creation. That means he'll have the nature of his father, right? Yeah. But he wasn't always man. He became man at a moment in time, right? Yeah, that's right. So he became man from whom? From Mary. That's from why she Mary. came to, you, to show yeah. you the role she played in bringing about Jesus in the flesh. Because it was that flesh that he used to save you from judgment. Mm. Now notice, as a man, he has a mother, no father, right? Yeah. And as God, he has a father, no mother. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. He has the nature of man, the nature of God. And in both natures, he only has one parent. As God, he has only a father, no mother. And as man, he has only a mother, no father. Yeah, that makes, yeah. yeah, that's right. So that's why Jesus is flesh, because he became flesh. But the Father never became flesh. The Holy Spirit never became flesh. Only Jesus did. And that's another story why he did. But for now, there is no problem. As God, the divine nature is spirit. It's not material. It's not bodily. It doesn't have a shape. Doesn't need time, space, or place. So the Father has that nature. Jesus' the Son has that nature. And the Holy Spirit has that nature because all three of them have the same nature. They're mm -hmm. not the same person, but they have the same nature. So as God, all three are spirit. But one of them also became flesh. And now because he's still man, a glorified man with a glorified physical body, he still has flesh. This is what Paul says. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord.
Romans 10, verses 9 to 13. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Now, the confess with the mouth means it has to be audible. It has to be verbal because this is what they would do in front of witnesses, especially at baptism. So right. if you do that, you're making a public confession of what's in your heart. What's in your heart? That Jesus is alive. He's not dead. God raised him and he reigns as Lord and he's Lord over my life. For with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes upon him will not be put to shame. See, Jesus is humble and compassionate. And he loves you. And he says, I'll never embarrass you. Mm -hmm. I'll never shame you. I'll never disgrace you. We Christians will, because we are jokes and we disappoint each other. But Jesus has sworn, I will never put you to shame. I'll never embarrass you. I love you too much to humiliate you. Now, if you sin against me and you defy me and you don't accept correction, then I have to discipline you. That's not yeah. something I want to do. Yeah, and that's fair. And that's only fair. Amen. Like a good father disciplines a wayward son, right? Yeah. Yeah. Watch here. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. See, God doesn't discriminate. He's impartial. He doesn't love Jews more than Greeks. He loves all creatures equally. For the same Lord is Lord of all, and he's abounding in riches for all who call upon him. He wants to lavish and spoil you with his spiritual blessings. Forever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, do you understand the implication of this? It's saying... Yeah, that would that was only work if it was to be worshipped in the true form of Christ. Amen. But also says, confess with your mouth. So this is something feel comfortable doing. And if you don't, that's fine. But if you want to publicly acknowledge the real Jesus here in front of witnesses as a record, I'd be more than happy to have you do that. But that's something you have to do from your heart. You can't do it out of coercion. I'm okay. Are you, yeah, I'm okay. yeah, I'm okay with that. So are, you, so are you sure from your heart you are at peace confessing the true Jesus and renouncing the Mormon Jesus? Yeah, I, I, I need to. All right. So what I want you to first do is I want you to just say, I renounce Joseph Smith. I renounce Joseph Smith. I renounce the Mormon church. I renounce the Mormon church. And I renounce the Mormon Jesus. And I renounce the Mormon Jesus. Now, from your heart, I want you to say this. I confess the real Jesus of history. I confess the real Jesus of history. Who is the Jesus of the New Testament? Who is the Jesus of the New Testament? And that Jesus is the uncreated Son of God. And that Jesus is the uncreated Son of God. Who became flesh from the Holy Virgin. Who became flesh from the Holy Virgin. To die for my sins. To die for my sins. So that I could be saved. So that I could be saved. And I confess Jesus is alive. I confess that Jesus is alive. Risen from the dead. <sighs> Risen from the dead. Never to die again. Never to die again. And I give him my heart. Give him my heart. My soul. My soul. <laughs> my spirit. My spirit. My entire body. My entire body. And I confess Jesus is my Lord. And I confess Jesus is my Lord. <sighs> and I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Because you love me. Because you love me. And I love you. And I love you. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen, brother. Now go get baptized. Yeah, I need to. Do it, brother. We love you. And you know where to find me. If you have questions, 99% of the objections I've answered on my channel and articles. I have thousands of videos and articles. If you need any help, let me know. But when you go to that true church, they will then catechize you and prepare you for baptism.